Would it blow your mind if I told you that more than half the cells in your body are not human, but bacteria? And more stunningly, if you only consider genetic material, that is DNA, more than 90% of it is in the bacteria that we host. This is because the 30 trillion human cells we roughly have contain the same DNA that was made by mixing your biological father and mother's DNA. On the other hand, the 40 trillion bacteria that we contain all have different DNA. So it begs the question, are we human or are we just bacteria that happens to use the human body for food and shelter? Before we move forward, let's clear up a technical point. It's not all bacteria. It's also fungi and viruses. But for the purpose of this video, we will ignore fungi and viruses because they don't play as critical a role as the bacteria do. Which brings us to this basic question. Where are all these bacteria? The answer, everywhere. They are in our skin, mouth, respiratory tract through which we breathe, eyes, urinary tract, and also our genitals. But all of these only add up to 20% of the bacteria we host because a whopping 80% of them live in our large intestine, gut bacteria. Why do they live there? Simple, the temperature is stable, the pH is constant, and most importantly, there is always food there because we eat every day and many of the nutrients that you cannot absorb become food for these bacteria. But we will get to that a little bit later. Humans and bacteria have evolved together in a symbiotic relationship. Over the last few million years, human diet and environment has constantly changed. We went from being hunter-gatherers eating whatever we could find to doing large-scale agriculture where we switched to eating a small number of things and mostly carbohydrates in the form of grains like rice or wheat to now eating a lot of ultra-processed food. So the bacteria that lived inside us adapted to the foods we ate over thousands of years and they got free food and shelter. But you might wonder, wouldn't our immune system kill these guys? I mean, that is what the immune system evolved to do. Great question. And to understand why, let's first explore how we got the trillions of bacteria that live inside our gut and what we get in exchange for providing them food and shelter. So how did they get there? Let's first define a term you're likely to see everywhere in this context. Gut microbiome. It's just a fancier way of saying the specific collection of various species of bacteria that live inside your gut. Our gut is home to over 1000 species of bacteria. This biodiversity is critical for the functioning of not just our digestive system, but our overall health and well-being. Each person's microbiome is as unique as a fingerprint, significantly influenced by genetics. For example, identical twins have more similar microbiomes than fraternal twins. The initial colonization of the microbiome happens at birth. Babies born via vaginal delivery. In India, we tend to call it normal delivery, thus suggesting that somehow the other way is not normal. So it's worth considering using more inclusive language. So babies born via vaginal delivery have different microbiomes than those born via cesarean section as they are exposed to different bacterial environments. Breastfeeding also contributes beneficial bacteria and in fact, it even includes nutrients that these bacteria need to survive initially. Think of these as first generation migrants who carry a lot of spices and pickles when they go abroad for the first time. But as we grow older, your diet, what you eat, has the most significant day-to-day -day impact on your gut bacteria. Diets rich in diverse types of fiber, such as fruits, vegetables, dal, and whole grains, promote a diverse microbiome. In contrast, a diet high in ultra-processed foods and sugar can lead to a less diverse gut environment. It also turns out that exposure to pets, dogs and cats, gives you a more diverse set of gut bacteria. 
people living in rural or more natural, less concrete-filled settings, especially early in life, have a more diverse gut microbiome. Fun fact, if you're obsessed with hygiene and keep sanitizing your hands, bathe two times a day, and also keep your house ultra clean, you will have a less diverse gut microbiome. So all you dirty, messy folks, your gut would like to thank you. Antibiotics can dramatically alter the gut microbiome by killing off billions of good bacteria in one shot. And not just the bad bacteria they are aimed at. Additionally, the use of anti-inflammatory drugs in general can also affect gut health. As we age, the diversity of the microbiome typically decreases. And as we get old, we also tend to take more medicines. And many of these are not great for gut bacteria, but you can compensate for this by eating more vegetables and fruits, getting more outdoor time and exercising more. But please don't skip your medicine, but stick to the prescribed dose. Like how we have our body's circadian rhythm of day and night, new research suggests that the microbiome has its own rhythms, which can be influenced by our sleep patterns, feeding times and other daily cycles. So if you have a disruptive life, like unpredictable eating schedules, late night work and irregular sleep, this will also negatively impact microbiome diversity. Stress can alter the gut microbiome. We still don't fully understand how, but it's clear that stress hormones and immune responses can influence gut bacteria. And last but not the least, People from different parts of the world have distinct microbiomes, influenced by cultural diet habits, environmental exposures, and even the bacteria that are native in those regions. But remember one thing, none of this means that you can never eat processed food, take an antibiotic, or work a night shift. These are meant to inform you about the things that keep your gut in good health and things that don't. You can always adjust. We're talking about trillions of bacteria. When you eat a cup of the heat curd, that has billion bacteria. Focus on the big picture, not individual choices. So if you have a stressful job, consider eating more fermented food, vegetables and fruits. And if you live in the city, go take walks in green spaces. So now that we have understood what factors determine the diversity and health of the gut microbiome, we get to the big question. What does the gut microbiome do for us? In the last decade or two, research into the role the gut bacteria play in our overall well-being has been eye-opening. But it must be said, there is more misinformation about gut on social media than there is about any other organ. Every other wellness influencer claims to be able to coach the gut, make it do bench presses, and also detox the gut. I have no idea what that even means. So let's get down to basics. I mean, after all, we give these guys two BHK South Bombay accommodations. So what do we get in exchange? Turns out, we get a lot. When we eat food, it is broken down into smaller molecules. And all the stuff we need, our small intestine takes it and puts it in the blood. What we cannot digest goes through the large intestine. And the trillions of bacteria rub their hands and go, ah, food. Fiber, for example, is something we cannot digest. But the bacteria will gladly do it for us. You know when you eat rajma or chana and you hear noises down there? That's billions of bacteria saying thank you and burping out carbon dioxide. And they also produce many vitamins and essential amino acids as byproducts. The gut microbiome plays an essential role in the development and function of the mucosal immune system. It helps protect the body from bad bacteria and supports the development of immune cells. It also helps to maintain the integrity of the gut lining, which acts as a barrier to prevent harmful toxins and pathogens from getting into our blood from the gut. And this is the most fascinating thing. There is a bi-directional communication system between the gut microbiome and the brain, known as the gut-brain axis. This can affect mood and behavior and is a growing area of research and can potentially help with mental health conditions such as depression and anxiety. Three terms that we keep hearing about are prebiotics, probiotics, and postbiotics. Prebiotics are foods that gut bacteria like eating, like anything with fiber, vegetables, fruits, dals. 
Probiotics are foods with living bacteria. These are like new immigrants applying for a H1 visa to move to the US. Foods like yogurt, kimchi, kanji, etc. Postbiotics are foods where we used microbes outside of our body to break food down into beneficial molecules. Things like idli or dosa are postbiotic. Bacteria fermented the batter, introduced beneficial nutrients and then died when we cooked the dish but we get the benefits of those nutrients. For example, lactobacteria make more protein available from urad dal and also unlock vitamins. Of course, with benefits come threats as well. Dysbiosis, which is an imbalance in the gut microbiome, has been linked to a range of diseases, including inflammatory bowel disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and even neurological disorders. So now that we have understood the basic science of the gut microbiome, let me introduce Dr. Saurabh Sethi, a practicing gastroenterologist in California who trained at Ames, Harvard and Stanford to address the most common questions all of us have about the gut. Dr. Sethi, how is the gut microbiome important to our health? Imagine your gut as a bustling city filled with trillions of tiny residents. This is a gut microbiome. These little helpers do a lot of amazing things. They help with digestion, make vitamins, and even keep our immune system strong. They're like our body's own superheroes, keeping us healthy. And guess what? They can even talk to our brain and affect how we feel. It is like a hidden world inside us that is super important for our well-being. So how does diet play a role in keeping the gut microbiome healthy? Our diet plays a big role in keeping the gut microbiome healthy. So what kinds of foods should we eat more of? Eating a variety of fruits, veggies, whole grains, and foods rich in fiber help nourish the good bacteria in your gut. These bacteria love fiber and use it as their favorite food. What should we eat less of? On the other hand, too much sugar and unhealthy fats can feed bad bacteria, causing an imbalance. Do probiotic supplements work? Probiotic foods like yogurt and fermented foods like kimchi and kefir introduce friendly bacteria directly into your gut. Also, drinking plenty of water and limiting processed food helps maintain a diverse and thriving gut microbiome. A balanced diet is like a buffet that keeps our gut superheroes well-fed and healthy. Eat more probiotic and prebiotic foods. The probiotic foods are the foods that contain live beneficial bacteria that directly help your gut. Think yogurt, idli, kanji, kafir, sauerkraut, kimchi and kombucha. When we eat these foods, we are introducing friendly bacteria into our gut like inviting new friends to the party. Prebiotic foods are the foods which are good bacteria in the gut like. These are foods that are rich in fiber which our body cannot fully digest but our gut bacteria absolutely love. Examples include whole grains, beans, legumes, onions, garlic and certain fruits like banana. The prebiotic foods are the fuel that keeps our superheroes strong and happy. To sum up, eat more foods like yogurt, sauerkraut, idli, kanji and other fermented foods that can introduce good bacteria to your gut and load up on fiber rich foods like whole grains, veggies and fruits to make sure that the good bacteria have plenty to munch on. It is like throwing a party for your gut that everyone enjoys. Therefore, we want to cut back on foods that can upset the balance of our fragile gut microbiome. Number one, sugar and highly processed foods. These can feed bad bacteria causing them to grow out of control. This can lead to an imbalance in our gut and potentially affect our overall health. Second, Foods high in unhealthy fats like trans fats and saturated fats can negatively impact the gut microbiome balance. Third, artificial sweeteners. Some studies suggest that artificial sweeteners might change the composition of our gut microbiome in ways that are not that great for our health. Fourth, antibiotics when not clearly indicated. While antibiotics can be life-saving, taking those when you really don't need them can disrupt the balance of your gut bacteria. If you do need those, it is a good idea to also consume probiotic-rich foods to help restore balance afterwards. So it is like avoiding foods that could crash your gut's party. Too much sugar, unhealthy fats, and unnecessary antibiotics can throw things out of whack. A balanced diet keeps your gut bacteria happy and your overall health in check. 
the probiotic supplements can be helpful for some people if they have certain gut issues like irritable bowel syndrome, clostridium difficile infection or if one is taking antibiotics which can disturb the balance of your gut bacteria. For most people without specific digestive health problem, eating a diet rich in naturally probiotic foods along with prebiotic fiber is generally a safer and more reliable way to support your gut health. Do sugar substitutes like stevia, aspartame, sucralose, etc. affect the gut? Yes, artificial sweeteners like aspartame and sucralose can have a negative effect on the gut microbiome. Safer, natural sugar alternatives would be stevia and monk fruit. However, it is important to make sure the ones you buy do not have erythritol as an additive because this can also disrupt the fragile gut microbiome. People taking antibiotics, do they just take vitamins or anything else? Avoid unnecessary antibiotics. Take antibiotics only prescribed by a healthcare professional and avoid using these when not needed to prevent unnecessary disruption of your gut microbiome. There is an Ayurvedic belief that mixing different fruits damages the gut microbiome. True or false? This is incorrect. Mixing fruits and veggies does not damage the gut microbiome. In fact, consuming a variety of fruits and veggies can be highly beneficial for your gut health. Both fruits and veggies provide essential nutrients, vitamins, minerals, and fiber that support the growth of beneficial gut bacteria. Eating whey protein damages the gut. True or false? This is incorrect. Consuming whey protein in moderation is unlikely to damage the gut. Whey protein is a complete protein derived from milk, meaning it contains all the essential amino acids that your body needs. For most people, whey protein is well tolerated and can be a convenient way to increase protein intake, support muscle recovery, and meet your fitness goals. However, excessive consumption of any protein supplement, including whey protein, might lead to digestive discomfort in some individuals. Does maida stick to the gut. A lot of people believe this. In my opinion, something that sticks to the gut cannot also spike your blood sugar. And Maida has no fiber. What do you think? Refined flour lacks fiber and nutrients compared to whole grains and it can lead to spikes in blood sugar levels because it is quickly broken down into glucose. While it does not literally stick to the gut, it can contribute to blood sugar fluctuations and potentially lead to energy crashes after the initial spike. In conclusion, for me personally, the fact that bacteria in your gut, beyond all the amazing things they do, can also affect how your regular human genes express themselves blows my mind. When gut bacteria from healthy mice were transplanted into highly stressed mice, they became less stressed. Scientists also found out that specific bacteria in a fly's gut can make the fly like eating more protein than sugar. Imagine the implications on dietary diseases. We have also found out that elite athletes have bacteria that can help with muscle recovery faster. And when we put these bacteria in mice, they run faster on treadmills. We cannot change our genes, but we can change our gut bacteria by eating healthy.